Hi there, this is Pastor Vlad and before we go into this week's content, I would like to invite you to become a part of what God is doing at Hungry Generation today. This year we've seen a great blessing of the Lord and anointing of God, God's healings and salvations and deliverances and in 2019 I know that God wants to take us further. And many of you who are watching this video right now and watching this message, you've been receiving from Hungry Gen, you've been growing, your world has been changing and we give to God all the glory. But we would like you in 2019 to become a part of what God is doing. And you can do that by sowing your best gift into this ministry or maybe doing something monthly like a partnership, a reoccurring gift. This will help us to go further in 2019 and bring more of what we're bringing to you to many, many more people. Me and my wife, we do that every single year. Our church does that every single year. Well, once a year, we give a special offering to God and then we also become partners of this ministry by our monthly contributions. And I give you that opportunity today to become our partner and to become somebody who contributes to what God is doing today. Below is a link where you can make that happen. So why don't you ask God, what would God have you give this year to this ministry to help us go further in God? And now let's go into this message. I want to speak to you today about path to freedom. This weekend has been a weekend of freedom. Yesterday there was prayers that were offered for people to find freedom sanctification. And this morning service, I focused on that. To be honest with you, I had a different message for the second service. But when I heard that the membership meeting was changed, so I need to preach and I heard that I'm going to preach on Wednesday. So I might preach the second service that I was supposed to preach on Wednesday night. So don't miss Wednesday night. We're doing a little promo for the Wednesday night right away. Amen. And then uh, there's a youth service happening tonight at 7.30. It's supposed to be at 6.30. It got moved to 7.30. Just giving you a heads up. Uh, don't come today after you go to the wedding and you eat all of that. The food needs to settle in. Don't go to sleep. Uh, come to church. With that said, book of Esther chapter 2 and verse 5. It says the following. In, in Sushan, Sinadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And then if you can flip a few pages to Esther chapter 5 and we will read Esther chapter 5 in just a minute. The story of Esther begins as such that Esther was chosen to be a queen for the king who dethroned another queen because she didn't show up because he ordered her to do so. And Esther who was adopted by Mordecai, her uncle, she was there and Mordecai, the Bible says in here, it gives us specifically where he came from. Now for most of us we read these names, Shammai, Jaira, Shanai, and we're like, you know what, it's not Petroi, Stepan, I don't care. But I want you to notice something here because there's a reason why this was mentioned here. Mordecai was a direct descendant of the family of Kish. Family of Kish is a family, Kish was the father to Saul, remember King Saul? So Kish comes from a family of Saul. Family, uh, Saul comes from the family of Kish and we see Mordecai, he also comes from the family of Kish. And why is that important? Because all of the book of Esther pretty much deals with one big enemy, his name was Haman. And Haman was a descendant of Amalek. Which tells me that Saul was commanded by God to completely wipe out Amalekites. That was promised to Joshua when Moses fought Amalekites and he spoke to Joshua. He says, God will wipe out the memory of Amalekites. And there was an appropriate time for that to happen because the wickedness of Amalekites reached the throne of God. And God commissioned Saul and says, I want you to go and completely wipe them out. King Saul, he disobeys God by giving God half obedience and he spares some of the best things including the king of Amalekites. Only decades later, years later, the very thing that King Saul did not defeat resurfaced again and his descendants were faced with it. Everything you don't win doesn't die with you. It goes to the next generation. Every battle 
that you are faced by God and God challenges you and God calls you to win and God calls you to obey Him. See a lot of us what we call defeat, God calls disobedience. What we say I've been defeated in this area in reality when Saul says well I didn't defeat the enemy you know I, I didn't do all of that it was actually disobedience. Every area of our life where there is disobedience there will always be defeat and that defeat is not something you will live with. That defeat will be passed on to your next generation. Now understand I'm looking at young adults mainly and you're not thinking about your next generation. You're thinking about survival. You're thinking about how to get through this year without maxing out all your credit cards. So next year you can buy what you want or, or live out purpose and travel and become an, an Instagram queen or an Instagram influencer and all of that. And that is great. There's nothing wrong with that. God bless you in your goals and in your pursuits. But I want to let you know Satan will fight you hard. Not only because so you can live in defeat. He knows that if he can defeat you, he doesn't really have to fight the next generation. They already inherited your defeat. They have odds stocked, stocked against them. Statistics says if your parents were alcoholics, your chances of becoming an alcoholic is 10 times more than someone whose parents were not alcoholics. That means that the battle for the next generation, if the previous generation loses it, becomes 10 times harder. And that's not even including the realities of the things that they have to fight. What am I trying to say with all of this? Is that many of us are fighting battles that didn't begin with us. Does that mean we're holding the other generation responsible? No. You're not responsible for what's passed on to you. You are responsible for what you activate and what you pass on to a next generation. When me and my wife purchased our um, duplex at, when we were married, we, say, we lived in apartments for a year and then we saved up some money and instead of buying a house, we bought a rental property so that you know, we can have a little bit extra of income and so we don't have to pay all the money for our mortgage. And we bought this really old rundown property because they usually sell for cheap and so we can fix it up. The guy who sold it to us was a lawyer. He didn't keep the property really well. In fact, it was so run down that one side looked like a gothic, like some ghost driven town. Uh, it had drug busts, windows broken, just, just, just dead cats buried like under the floor. Just, just, just scary stuff. We, we sprayed it and prayed it and oil. I, I poured everything on it, on those walls. So to sanctify it and, and to, to cleanse it and to, to purify it. And one of the things that it had on that house is the lawn, the front lawn and the back lawn was extremely unkept. There was no irrigation system installed. The, the weeds were literally to my, to my knees. And you know, when, when I saw them, there's, there's, there were so much weeds that I was afraid to mow those weeds because I never knew what lived there. I'm, I'm looking at them thinking, I'm like, man, this, this stuff is like, there's spirits there probably. Or like some kind of a snakes that live there. I remember first time I mowed it with my push lawnmower and it, it, it would get stuck every few feet or so. Now, I could have stayed there and, and called that guy who sold us the house say, how dare you? You know, what kind of a citizen are you? You know, aren't you thinking you're a lawyer, but you, there's no brains in your head because you're not even taking care of your own house. What kind of, I, I could have built a case against him. But I mean, that, that's not going to help my lawn right the lawn is not going to get better because I'm blaming somebody so I took the lawn mower mowing the lawn once mowing the lawn second time put the sprinkler system start you know putting weed and feed and then putting all kinds of stuff and then after about a few years all of the stuff got cleared out and when we sold the property a few years ago you know not only it was completely remodeled but the lawn looked like somebody actually put a lawn there instead of build that and I passed on something that was good Maybe your situation today is the same. Perhaps even as one of the young men shared, perhaps you come from a broken family. Perhaps divorce is, you're accustomed to it. Parents fighting with each other and World War III is already happening in your house. The world just doesn't know yet. Perhaps sickness and disease runs rampant. People don't take care of their bodies. People don't take care of what they eat. People don't take care of, um, they, they, don't, they don't exercise. They, they don't think that that's important to take care of your temple. Perhaps there is a, anxiety and fear and depression that is normal. Nobody can sleep in the house without popping pills. Perhaps in your house there's abuse of alcohol and that's what you've been accustomed to and it's something that you've been tempted with. Perhaps there's lust that runs in your family tree. My encouragement today to you is that Mordecai faced an enemy that belonged to his ancestors but he didn't blame Saul for that. He faced him. He overcame them and Esther and Mordecai did not pass on Amalekites to the next generation. They, they passed on a festival. They passed on a holiday that Jews celebrate till this day where they celebrate the victory that Mordecai and Esther achieved. 
pass on triumphs to the next generation, not trials. Many of you sitting here today, you come from a good family. You come from a family where your mom and dad is together. For you, the idea of divorce is strange, it's alien. The same way as it is for me. My mom and my dad have been married for over 30, 33, 33 years. My grandpa passed away last year, 93 or 92 on, on his birthday. He was a pastor. His grandpa, his dad, Lazarus, was a pastor. And they were in ministry. They were married all their life. Never seen my mom or dad, you know, argue. They fight sometimes. But my dad learned the secret to marriage is always listen to my mom. It's Ukrainian. My mom is a Ukrainian woman. Short, a little feisty. <laughs> and as long as dad obeys her, everything is fine. <laughs> Husbands listen. <laughs> Amen. But and I see that to, they're together. I see they love each other. I see that they care of us as a family. And so for me, it's very easy. It's easier to be able to see challenges in my relationship with my wife and overcome them because my parents passed on something to me that I'm benefiting from. Same thing with finances. To manage finances, it comes a lot easier for me because my dad does it. My dad never gave me a financial lesson. He never set me down and went Dave Ramsey on me. My dad simply lived his life balancing his books, never owning money to anybody and always was very generous and seeing that and seeing how he modeled that to me, it comes very easy for me to manage my finances that even when we give all of our money away, I still, we're still able to manage it in a way that, that glorifies God and in a way that helps us to, to take care of our needs because that was passed on to us. And so the Bible says in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, 18, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed from corruptible things, like with corruptible things like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. 2 Timothy 1, 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, I am persuaded it is in you. I want you to see both of these scriptures. Peter is saying God redeemed us from things that were passed down from our fathers and Apostle Timothy says, Timothy, Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he says, Timothy there was your faith. I know your grandma. She had that faith. Your mama has the same faith and he says, I'm persuaded. You got the same faith. That tells me though you can't pass on salvation to the next generation, you can pass on your faith, your passion for God. You can pass on good things to the next generation. That's why devil fights you hard. He will fight me hard because he knows if I beat him at this level, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be easier for the next generation to overcome the enemy. When King David died, he passed on to his son Solomon a lot of good things. He passed on to him a lot of money. He passed on to him a throne. He passed on to him a crown. He passed on to him authority. He passed on to him houses. And he passed on to him a blueprint for how to build the temple. But there was one more thing that King David passed on is that he gave him a very clear description that though King David will die, the enemies King David accumulated throughout his life will not. They will be passed on to Solomon. And King David was very clear to Solomon and he says this and he actually named those enemies. He says this is the guy, that's the guy, that's the guy, he lives there, that guy lives there, that guy lives there. He says make sure none of them die normally. Meaning you take care of them. Solomon is young and inexperienced. That's before Solomon had the wisdom from God. Before Solomon builds his house and builds the house of the Lord. The Bible says that Solomon, the first I think chapter of the the kings, kings chapter 2, you see one problem surfaces. It's his daddy's problem. One guy begins to make some fuss and ask for something that he shouldn't be asking. Boom, he surfaces. And then another surfaces. Then Solomon gave another person a restriction. Says you can't go past Jerusalem. And I want you to see this. The Solomon doesn't go building his kingdom until he establishes his kingdom by getting rid of his daddy's demons. Impatience, anger, passivity, laziness, gossiping about pastors, constantly criticizing worship. I met a person uh, yesterday here who says, I criticized your church and I really, really apologize. And he says, my daughter today don't go to church. Those things, some of you, you're battling with that inside of you. And it's battle that didn't begin with you it began somewhere else 
if you don't win it it will continue but I'm challenging you today this afternoon that the Holy Spirit has empowered you to have victory in your life and for the future generations the Holy Spirit wants you and I to win as many battles as we can so that the next generation will use our ceiling as their floor you're not responsible for what's passed on to you you are responsible for what you activate scientists did a study and they found out there are certain things that are passed on in our dna not only the color of hair the color of skin the color of eyes but our characteristics sicknesses health habits are passed on also in our dna that's why when you go to the doctor he doesn't just ask you hey uh, you had a flu for how long what are some of the symptoms if you fill out the first time you go to the doctor you fill out the application they will ask you about your grandma like she lives in moscow why would you want to know my, my grandma what, what about your uncles they, they'll ask you about your parents you say I, I don't know my parents i don't talk to them they want to know has diabetes been in your family they will ask you has the heart problem is it something that goes in your family and you can say well doctor I, I don't believe in that stuff because under the blood all of that is taken care of he doesn't care what you believe because science doesn't operate by belief system they believe by, they, they operate by facts and it's, it's been proven scientifically that there are things that are laying in my dna and your dna passed down from my father that can be activated or deactivated based on my choices my experiences and my associations good or bad you can have faith passed on to you you can have good marriage passed on to you by your parents you can have a prayer life passed on to you by your parents laying dormant until it's activated by your choices your associations and your experiences that's why when you go to a bible school that's why when you go to and, and have an encounter with god you have an experience with god when you connect yourself with the right people you have proper associations and then when you have a proper you make a decision this is what happens it begins to activate certain those things and you go into ministry and it's not necessarily because you just went into ministry because your daddy was in ministry but at the same time there was choices associations and experiences that activated the same grace that is moving from your father god of abraham god of isaac and god of jacob god is a generational god god doesn't just want the blessing and favor to rest on you he wants you to spread to the next generation and generation after on your children your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren so is the devil he doesn't want porn to be your, your problem he wants your children's problem to be the same he doesn't want depression to be your problem he doesn't want nightmares to be your problem he wants that to be just going through you to other generation that's why today it's not an option to live a victorious life i don't care if you're 15 or if you're 27 victory is our portion and we have to do it for our sake for god's sake and for generations sake come on somebody are you with me how do we receive how do we walk in that victory how do we receive that victory and we're going to look, take a look at book of esther chapter 5 and i'm going to share with you three simple steps on how to walk in victory receive victory now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across of the king's house. While the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, a lot of royal, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half of the kingdom. And so Esther answered, Please increase the limit on my credit card so I can buy more shoes from China. <laughs> I'm just checking if you're listening. <laughs> And Queen Esther answered, we're about to die, kill Haman. That's not what it says. If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. She knew the key to every man's heart. It's food. Especially good food. Mama's food. <laughs> She says, I want you to come to my banquet. Dear Lord, I ask you that today you will open our hearts to your word, to your faith. And I pray that you will help us to receive what we came for today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to see, first of all, is when Haman, the enemy who's been there for generations before, resurfaced. 
that Esther's first reaction to dealing with Haman was not political or physical. Now this problem that her life would be destroyed, the Jewish people would die, this was a real problem. It was, a, it was not a spiritual, made up, mystical problem somewhere on, Mar on Mars. This was here, right here, you could see it, everybody gonna die. Die means uh, no more. Physical problem, real problem. Esther, unlike many people in Babylon, had a position which she could leverage to solve that problem. She was in a very high political place. In fact, she was so close. I'm pretty sure she had a speed on speed dial. Many of the governors, many of the people who influenced different territories, she could have easily pulled the strings, called a committee, created a campaign, create a GoFundMe account. She could have did some physical things to pull the strings, influence her husband who was the king to move upon the supreme court of that land to reverse the law. But when Esther hears of this problem that is physical I want you to see what Esther does not do she doesn't lean on her political connections she doesn't lean on her political abilities she calls the whole nation now this is the girl she didn't win a championship of the cutest girl on Instagram this girl she was the queen she was the most influential when it comes to women. She had a platform, she had the looks, she had the favor. But this girl, she got brains. In order to discern that this problem is spiritual and it doesn't require my political connections and my good face, it requires something bigger, it requires spiritual, spiritual solution. She gets the whole nation to do what? Fast and pray. She doesn't create a, a GoFund account. Let's defund Mordecai. She doesn't call up her connection. She says, I want to bring the whole nation to fast and pray. Dear friends, having a good looking body and no brains here is no good. <laughs> having big pocket but not seeing the spiritual world is no good. Having a status of a millionaire but not understanding that the world you live in is spiritual is not good. The Bible says we do not wage a war in the physical realm. We fight a spiritual warfare. This war exists right now whether you like it or not, whether you like to admit it or not, whether you are engaged in this warfare or not, it is up to you and I. And that is why fasting and prayer is not an option to people who understand the world they live in is spiritual. The problems they face might be physical but many times, many times the roots of those problems are not visible to a human eye. That's why therapy, that's why counseling, that's why many times medicine, all of that numbs those problems but many, many, many times they don't necessarily fix them. What am I trying to say? Many of our problems that we face right now are physical but the roots are spiritual and their solution has to be not fists but knees. Uh, when I went to a GROW conference um, in Portland, the, the second largest church in America, the Church of Highlands, and they have a whole system called the uh, growth track and all of this stuff and we use that system. And the senior pastor, Chris Hodges, he does this whole thing of describing how they bring people to church, how they disciple them, all of those things that I know some of you guys even do here as well. And then at the end he does this thing where he talks about prayer and fasting, how they do twice a year 21 days of prayer and fasting. And something that shocked me hearing that from, from American churches, especially church that size. And he says, if you do every single thing that we do, but you don't pray and you don't fast, he says, it will not work. And this is why. Because church is not a social club. Church is not scratch my back, I scratch your back club. Church is a spiritual place. Church is a place where people get plucked out of hell and put into heaven. Church is a place where the warfare is being done for the souls of people. Because church is a place that deals with the eternity of people. And there are spiritual forces that do not want that to happen. And they occupy, the Bible says they live in the heavenly places. And when you fast and pray, now you might not understand anything about spiritual world. And that's completely fine. But something happens when you pray and fast, the spiritual world begins to move. When Moses lifted his hands on the mountain and Joshua fought on the bottom of the mountain against the Malachites, anytime the hands were up, Joshua was winning. When the hands went down, Joshua was losing. So the, the victory did not depend on how strong Joshua was. It depended on how high his hands went up. 
I genuinely believe that Jesus says this kind doesn't come out by prayer and fasting. There are forces of darkness can never be crushed in our city and in our region except if we pray and fast. Fasting and prayer is not an option for people living in a broken world. Not only if we humble ourselves by it, not only we see God, but it's like Daniel who fasted 21 days and the prince of Persia, the Bible says he was occupying. Prince of Persia wasn't the guy who was sitting on the throne. It's the guy who occupied the guy who sat on the throne. It was a spiritual entity and when Daniel fasted and prayed, Daniel wasn't rebuking the devil. Daniel was just fasting. Daniel was just seeking God. But God's angels were moving on his behalf. I'm not saying to go demon hunting and looking for devils behind every bush. What I'm saying is you get on your face before God and recognize that everything that you face in life you can fix because you have more degrees than a thermometer. You can fix because you got connections. You can fix because you finally reached 10,000 followers on Instagram. You can fix just because you got money in your bank account or just because you have a good health insurance. You, none of that stuff really matters if what you're facing is spiritual. What matters is our prayer and humility before God and his fasting. I challenge some of you. In fact, when your church is fasting and you are not and you don't have a health problem, why? What can be any other excuse except pure laziness? I'm gonna die. Really? Most of us will die because of overeating. This is not third world country. We live in a nation where most of our diseases is because we eat too much. You're not going to die. You will actually live. <laughs> and very long, perhaps. I'm going to have a headache. Because you're drinking too much Dr. Pepper. And that's a cleansing system. You're not going to die. It's going to feel like your flesh is going to suffer for a little bit. But then you're either going to break your flesh or you're going to break your heart one day. I challenge each one of you. There is no excuse when the church, I don't like, forgive me, I just get a bit emotional when I, when I talk about this. Because as a church, we fast three, three days every month. So after our last Sunday, uh, every month, then we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, after the last Sunday, every single month. We've been doing this for the last few years. And, and this is not a like, oh, if you feel like, really? What, what do you think? Devil wakes up and says, well, I don't know how I feel about attacking them today. <laughs> really? You don't wake up in the morning and your flesh doesn't say, well, I don't feel like attacking you today. That doesn't happen. That's not an option. People have built a life of prayer and fasting to Christians today. It's like, it's like a super life. There's a basic life where you don't do anything. You're a couch potato. And then there's like a deeper life. No, no, no. That is the only Christian life we have. It's whether we follow Jesus or we don't follow Jesus. Nothing in between. I just, just sense a little condemnation, Vlad, coming from you. <laughs> if your lazy self is offended, I'm happy. <laughs> My goal is to electrocute the fence you're sitting on right now. If you're sitting on the fence between this or between that, my goal is to make you to jump this way or that way. If God is the Lord, Elijah says, we follow him. If he is not, we pack our bags, go smoke pot and go to hell. But we don't choose to go to hell. That means we need to go run after God 100%. And the problem with many of us, when we serve the devil, we went all the way. And when we serve God, we do bare minimum. When we did drugs, $500 every single month went to do drugs. And our tithing record is $50 a month. What kind of madness is that? So we could spend money on drugs that destroyed us and we can't be generous. I don't believe in tithing. You tie to the kingdom of the devil and you can't tie to the kingdom of God. Get rid of that Judas problem and give God everything that you got. You only got one life. You have no right to live a normal life if he died a brutal death. And if that offends you, look at the cross. There is no right I have to live a normal life if my Savior died a brutal death for a wretch like me. We owe to live with every fiber of our being for him that means humbling yourself that means praying that means fasting and when we do that things shift in the realm of the spirit you might not feel it you might not see it but it does happen you're a praying church and I believe even as the new campus is starting 
as the new service is starting without prayer and without fasting in this country now we can bring people from other churches please understand moving money from my savings to my checkings doesn't make me richer we can make better music better programs but a young lady who shared a testimony from another country the lost people don't come because only come because of God social media brings them to church only Holy Spirit brings them to God we have today pretty much 50% of all the people that come to our church come through social media that's why we put a lot of emphasis on social media we stop doing television we stop pretty much doing everything putting all the money into social media because it brings a lot of people to church but once they are here only the Holy Spirit can bring them to Christ because the gospel is offensive we believe in a guy who became a man and died and rose again that's offensive and if that's not offensive I don't know what it is and only the Holy Spirit can convict somebody's heart we pray out loud we pray passionately and our services are not microwaves they're not an hour and 20 minutes they're two hours and 30 minutes and that's not gonna happen that's not gonna be for normal people and I don't want normal I want God to convert people I want when people to be saved to be saved to be born again not just to pray a sinner's prayer I like what Charles Spurgeon said they said that because Charles Spurgeon had this follow-up program where the next morning at five in the morning they had to show up at his office and they said if somebody gets saved by next morning they'll lose the conviction he says if you put a uh, a nail in the needles in the eye of a bull he says it will not stop hurting by next morning what he was saying he says when the Holy Spirit wounds a soul like that he says it will stay there and to do that we need God we need the move of the Holy Spirit we need a shift in the realm of the Spirit and for that to happen that's why we pray that's why we fast that's why the church is doing 21 day fast and I ask you if you have not been doing it if you've been iffy uh, this is for them this is not for me I rebuke you kindly in Jesus name and I ask you to snap out this year is not supposed to be the same year that was last year for you and most likely those of you who are saying stuff like that right now you have issues you're fighting you can't beat on your own perhaps one of those issues is a passive spirit is this passivity this couch potato thing where you just don't feel where you just don't, don't you just don't have that and that can be broken if you get on your knees if you put the foot away and say Lord I need you more like Esther I don't rely on my looks I don't rely on my connections I don't rely on my com uh, uh, committees Lord we rely on you so the first thing is that we have to win the battle in the spiritual realm if we want to see the change in the natural realm number two we see that Esther after three days when she fasted and prayed I'm sorry I kind of went off a little bit uh, right now so pastor you take care of that afterwards yeah sorry I just kind of oh, I feel better <laughs> secondly is that we see here that on, after the third day of fasting Esther she put on her royal garments the Bible says and she went to the royal palace to see the king so the fasting I believe it changes things in the realm of the spirit it breaks spiritual strongholds yes it helps us to humble ourselves there's a lot of benefits of fasting and your pastor did a phenomenal teaching you can see it on YouTube four types of fasting and so there's a lot of teaching that, that is in this house and so I, I don't want to take time to talk about that um, but that's one of the things that it does is it changes things in the realm of the spirit but the second thing that I want us to see for us to experience true freedom is is not only to pray and fast and to fight spiritual forces but secondly is that we have to put on royal garments instead of rags of our problems what does it mean it means that we have to mentally dress up instead of dress down we have to dress up in royal garments instead of dress down in rags Esther could have easily been dressed down in rags of her problem her heart was broken her nation was about to be wiped out she just fasted for three days she could have easily put on the worst kind of clothes that she had ripped and put holes in them and walk into the king like some kind of a beggar and plead and beg but I want you to see that Esther didn't see the change yet Haman was still there and he was still smiling and laughing he was still near to the king but Esther did not wait for the change in life before she changed how she thought how she perceives herself and saw how she carried herself that tells me that spiritual breakthrough in the spiritual realm must lead to having a breakthrough in your heart or in your mind before there's a breakthrough that manifests itself in your life 
meaning renewing of the mind precedes the transformation of our life Romans chapter 12 verse 2 it says that present your bodies as a living sacrifice and it says this do not conform to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind what it means is that don't let your mind be conformed to what's happening around in your life right now let it be transformed by what God says in his word but what hinders that in our life many times is that we say well but my life is not changed yet my kids are not serving God yet but I don't have a boyfriend I don't have a job but my bills are not being paid for but I don't know what to do with my future but I'm still battling with this pain from my past and so until all of that is taken care of only then my mind will be changed that tells me your mind is conformed to your world instead of transformed by his word don't dress your mind down to the world you are in dress it up with the word that you're living in the truth of God Jesus says you shall know the truth and what the truth will set you free that tells me that the freedom exists is not only on the level of the spirit where Jesus comes and rebukes the devil with the anointing of God breaks the yoke but that is a freedom that exists through knowing the truth that breaks certain things here, breaks certain things here, breaks my speech pattern, breaks my how I feel, how I think and how I speak and that leads me to freedom. If you don't see freedom after fasting and after praying, the Lord wants you also to fill your mind with His truth to that degree that it changes how you see yourself. Presence of truth doesn't make anybody free. The same way as presence of soap doesn't make anybody clean. You can have a truckload of soap in your garage and stink like a skunk. None of you do, I know. So relax. But soap doesn't make you clean. It's applying soap that makes you clean. Putting it wherever you want it to be clean, that's where you put the soap. And you don't just kind of put it casually, religiously. No, you scrub it. And when you have negativity, when you have brokenness here, you have to take that truth and you got to scrub your soul with it. It's good. It's important to pray. It's important to fast after three days. Esther put on the royal garments and that tells me that after I pray, after I fast, I also have to take the word of God and I have to let it conform me instead of me being conformed to my situation and me being conformed, excuse me, to my problem or whatever I am going through right now. The problem happens with our problems is that when you stay in them so long they begin to affect how you think and how you feel. That even if the Lord takes you out of that problem you still think the same way. It, just, it explains why Israel though leaving Egypt still were slaves. Because when you stay in slavery for 400 years it's not just a place it becomes your identity. I think I've shared this a few years ago is when they did an experiment on a fish, one barracuda fish. They put a barracuda fish in the fish tank and they put other small fish in the fish tank. Barracuda fish is not born again so she eats other fish for living. So she went to the other side and ate the rest of the fish. They put a glass in between the barracuda fish and other fish. They put a glass there and so barracuda fish can't see through the glass and so it was going to the other fish and BAM hit the glass. Kind of stretch yourself realize okay maybe I shouldn't be going that fast next time so next time it went a little bit slower it still hit the glass third time it hit the glass fourth time it realized don't go to the other side they removed the glass after a few days and the barracuda fish never went to the other side glass was no longer there why because the glass that was in the fish tank after hitting it so much went into her mind if it happens with the fish it happens with people after you experience hurt and abuse, after you experience certain things for so long, many times what many of us do is we're like Titanic. We're letting the world that's on the outside to get inside and we become conformed to that world that we are in. And therefore our mind are dressed in rags. We can pray and fast but if we don't change the mental dress code and we don't put the truth of God inside of us, if we don't change who we are because of what God says, instead of being defined by what we feel, what we see, what people have said about us, the labels we've been given, what we've experienced, if we don't do that we will continue to live feeling like nothing is changing even if God changes everything and everyone and then we do this prayer change everybody Lord change my husband change the president change the pastor change the deacons change my children change the weather and God while you're at it change yourself but just don't touch me because I wait for everybody to change and only then I'll feel better 
The Bible says, do not conform yourself to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Meaning we have the truth of God and we have to allow it to define who we are. Many of you here, you're, you're young people and um, you probably have a nice car from what I've seen in the parking lot. God bless your soul. But many of your cars have salvage title. <laughs> Shall we ask raising of the hands? No, 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 we won't do that. No shame and condemnation to those who are in Living Stream Church. Amen. What is a salvage title? Russians understand. It's very simple. You bought a car on the auction <laughs> for a little discount. <laughs> and then Victor at that shop, he fixed it for you for half price. <laughs> car on the auction just means the car been through something. Had a, had a rough day. And then you had somebody else fix it. They fixed, if they fixed it really good, an average Joe is not going to see the difference. He's going to see your car, he's going to say, man, you got a nice car. And you're going to say, yes, I do. Until you have to sell it. And they look at the car, I mean, 45,000 miles on the Toyota Camry, super deal. Looks great, clean, smells good. Until you have to tell them of what it says on the title deed. And then the atmosphere changes. You say, well, this car... Um, had a, a salvage title oh okay well I'll call you later then that's why salvage cars they don't sell as good as the other cars most banks will not loan you money everything's fine with the car something is wrong with the title deed why because what the car went through went on a title deed and because of that word on the title deed in the glove box rebuilt salvage it reduces the value of the car, causes conversations to be awkward and makes you have a great car but no, you don't have a great car. And many people, exactly what the devil does, you go through stuff and those problems it go into the glove box of your mind and people start treating themselves, settling for less. Why? Because, well, what I've been, I've been, I've done drugs or I've been delivered from this or um, in my past life, you know, I've lost virginity. I've been struggling with this before and so what happens even if God delivers you the devil says well that's great that he delivered you but make sure let me put a stamp on your consciousness and on your mind that you are salvage why because as long as you think you're salvage you'll always sell yourself for less you will make your life painful you will say no Vlad I don't do that it's just people think of me like that have you ever tried to pay your utility bills with people's opinions People's opinions are like feet. Everyone has them and sometimes they stink. <laughs> what people say is one thing. The question is, what do you think? The question is, what do you feel? What do you speak? What does it say on your mind? Now, does it say what God says? The truth of God? Or does it say your, has, your history or your past or your mistakes? Does it say, because my Bible says those who are in Christ are new creation. I, I didn't find it there. It says rebuilt. It didn't say those who are in Christ are salvage title. It says those who are in Christ are new creation. But see the church will see you, people will see you, you will see you as rebuilt. And that's why when you fight in the spiritual realm, you have to also fight in the realm of your mind where you remove what the world says, what you say, what others say, what you feel and put only what God says about you and the truth of God's word. You may say, but what if it's not true? You have to understand is that the truth of God is the truth. Every, everything that's facts could change but the truth never changes. Muhammad said I'm the prophet of truth. Buddha said I'm the seeker of truth. Jesus said I am the truth. In other words you got to know Jesus intimately that it affects the title deed that's in your glove box right now. So many young ladies they've had a sin in their past before they came to Christ and after they've repented but there is a thing that exists in their title deed that says but I've lost my this, I've lost my that and therefore God can never send me a great man. God can never send me a great marriage. God can never bless me with a great future. Who told you that? They did. Did he say that? Remove the rags, put on the royal garments and you will see what God will bless you with. Because you don't, you don't attract into your life what people say. You attract what you believe and you can believe God's word and you can believe your feelings and other people's experiences. And I want to challenge each one of you here today 
begin to change how you see yourself based on God's word instead of how you feel. For example, if you're battling with sin, when you fight, when you fast, when you say, Lord deliver me from that, you, you go for prayer, somebody prays for you, like man I feel God delivered me. You get up from that prayer, you must change how you see yourself. That means like a brother mentioned, you no longer see yourself as a sinner who's trying to get righteous. You see yourself as a righteous who fights sin. You may say, oh it's just a play of words. It's not a play of words, it's a change of position. Because one says I'm a sinner, the other one says I'm a righteous. And Bible tells me that the righteous person falls seven times and he what? A wicked, the next verse says the wicked falls by calamity. Meaning the wicked doesn't even fall into sin, he falls by a problem and he can't get up. Why? Because of who he is. A righteous man is bold as a lion. That means that I have to adjust when I become a Christian, when I become free, when I receive deliverance from God, when I feel things shifted in the realm of the spirit, something has to shift in my mind. I no longer associate myself with my sin or my struggle. I associate myself with Christ. I died with him. I live with him. I see, I'm sitting with him. I am in him. Do I still fight sin? Of course I do. Sometimes even stronger than before. But I don't fight a sin as a sinner. I fight a sin as a son. I am a son who fights a sin. I'm a righteous person who fights a sin. I always tell our church, I tell them to tell yourself all the time, I'm not a weak person trying to get strong. I'm a strong person fighting weakness. I'm not a sinner trying to get righteous. I'm a righteous person fighting weakness. I'm not a sick person, in fact, trying to get healthy. I'm a healthy person fighting sickness. Every doctor will tell you there is nothing wrong with your body. If they remove that virus, they remove that cancer, if they remove that little thing, your body is fine. Therefore, you can't let one little cell or one little tumor or one little cyst change who you are now. That doesn't mean you reject the reality of the problem, the sickness, the, the issue, the, the stronghold, the, the, the problem. It just means you don't make it who you are. You make it who you are, whose you are. And from that position you fight. It does not mean that when I renew my mind that I am righteous in God, I am victorious. That, that means, that's it, the devil comes like, okay, I give up. No, in fact. He will fight you stronger. When God came to Joshua and says, Joshua, I gave you promised land. You did not see Midianites and Jebusites and all of the other ites. They didn't come and say, Joshua, we surrender. None of them surrendered. In fact, every piece of promised land Joshua won by war. But he got the victory before he got the battle. You have to have victory before you fight from God, from the Holy Spirit. Victory over sin, victory over doubt, victory over depression, victory over sadness. It comes from renewing your mind by His Word. You may say, but what if like that doesn't actually work? Uh, if that doesn't work, the sun will fall out of its orbit and the earth will stop having gravity. If God's Word doesn't have power, we're toast. I trust in his word. Now does that mean that always we see what we pray for, what we believe for? No. Does that mean the righteous man then never falls? He still falls. In fact sometimes such a knucklehead falls seven times. He's still righteous because he gets up. He anchors his identity in something new. You know I've shared this in a brief yesterday what I've seen um, happen with my wife. When we got married my wife was uh, battling with chronic nightmares and loneliness a sense of rejection. It was very difficult for her to connect in church uh, in the ministry that she was in and I thought this is just normal way of couples adjusting. She's in a new place, you know our church is kind of different and um, maybe it's gonna take you know six, seven, seven, eight months and uh, six, seven months you know passed but it wasn't changing and I started to recognize that it was a spiritual problem because anytime that she would sleep she would have these just attacks. It was attacks in her sleep, attacks at her night and she had a really difficult time um, working. She had a difficult time being in church and she just wanted to go home. Now as a pastor, you know, it, it, it's, it kind of breaks your heart when, you know, your own wife doesn't want to be in your church. There's no way you can explain it. And so I didn't tell it to anybody. And secondly, you know, I'm, I cared a lot about my reputation at the time. You know, we would come to church. Our church at the time was very small. Our prayer meetings on Tuesday, they were, they were just a bunch of friends and relatives. Uh, one small room, maybe 10 people, 12 people. So if somebody is not praying, like it's clearly evident. <laughs> so, and it would always happen that my wife, like on those days that she just like, 
it's like she just had this Zacchaeus disease, the spirit of silence would come and she wouldn't pray. And you know, I'm Pentecostal. Like we need to like pray, pray. <laughs> like you don't feel the spirit. Like, you got to you got to show, you got it. So you know, we're there, you know, and no matter if I had an argument with my wife or not, they're going like, hallelujah, you know, and I'm like, you know, you got to fake it till you make it. And my wife stands there and one thing I love about my wife, she's never fake to the point that it embarrasses me sometimes. She will always be true to herself. She doesn't feel it, she'll never fake it. So she just stood there. And my pastor, my uncle looks, you know, and I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to cover my wife so nobody sees that she's not praying because I'm embarrassed. You know, I'm supposed to have a praying on fire wife. You know, brought her from another state, another, another city. And so, you know, she needs to show that, hey, I made a right choice. Yeah, and she wasn't praying for a long time. So we started to pray for her freedom. And then I decided to, you know, decided, you know what? As a man of God, I need to deliver my wife from her demons. And then, you know, when you stop being a husband and you become a deliverer in your house, you quickly find out, it ain't gonna work. And so I laid my hands on her, prayed for her with oil, with, with everything that I had. And, and nothing, and she was very, very kind and submissive. She let me pray for her. And then, you know, I started to tell her, come on, you know, you're stronger. You, know, you can do this. Come on, this shouldn't affect you. You, you can beat this. You know, and I, I tried to push her into, into that. I tried to make her to pray. I said, listen, I don't have this, and I pray a lot, and you don't pray. You need to pray more. You need to read the Bible more. And, of course, the more I told her what to do, the less she wanted to talk to me. Then, of course, God taught me that God didn't call me to deliver my wife. He called me to love her. And that was a very painful revelation. And so when I started to love her and literally, and all the guys will understand maybe, uh, I treated in my mind. I acted with her as I would act if somebody I had that I was married to who was not a Christian. Just to give her space and say, Lord, I'm going to love her. I'm going to pray for her. And I'm going to be there with her because I can't change that woman. I mean, I can't even change myself. The Holy Spirit started to do His work. And all these prayers that we prayed, they had some effect in the spiritual world. But she still had exactly the same feelings, exactly the same thoughts, and exactly the same nightmares. To the point, she was working in a post office and she decided to start filling her mind with the Word of God. She was able to because her work allowed her to. That She was able to listen to podcasts and listen to the Bible from five to six hours, Monday through Saturday, for two years. And I started to see a change in my wife. She still had the nightmares. She still couldn't connect in the church. She still had those moments. But now I had freedom not to change her because I knew it's not happening. But to be there to love her, you can't grow a flower by pulling her. You got to water the flower. And so, and then this truth started to change how she started to think. So when she would have those nightmares where somebody was choking or somebody was attacking her, when she would wake up, she now wanted to pray instead of saying, I don't want to do anything. She now would rebuke. She would say, no, this doesn't belong to me. That is not who I am. I'm a child of God. Now she would start to take authority. And then instead of waiting for all the girls in the church to accept her and welcome her, she just found the ones that nobody wanted to be with and started the home group with them. I remember at one particular time, you know, I was trying to, before this, trying to really set her up with her sister because her sister was her best friend. So I wanted to bring her sister, you know, marry one of the guys on our team. And I kind of set up a blind date. And her sister ran from that date and <laughs> came. She's like, who's that weirdo? I was like, oh, come on. I was really hoping that, you know, that you marry him so you can move here. She's like, even if I'll marry him, I'll take him there. He's, I'm not moving here. Because I was thinking the solution would be if I just bring some friends to my wife, it will, it will solve the problem and nobody wanted to move. And then when all of this started to change, within about a year and a half to two years, when things started to change, the nightmare subsided. Her ministry started to open up without me trying to push her into anything. She, she's on her own, started to serve other girls, started to minister to others. Her prayer life changed. Where today, you know, I see her every day, Monday to Friday. You know, for one hour from 6 to 7 o'clock, pretty much every single day, I see her at church praying on her own. I don't tell her because I go there a little bit earlier. I don't tell her to do it. I'm checking her. Now that that prayer life started, our relationship changed. Her sister got married to my brother <laughs> and moved to our city. God does miracles. And she loves our city now. You know, but now my wife doesn't need her sister. <laughs> we tell our sisters, like, we don't need you now, okay? 
you can move back <laughs> but but you can stay and today God God has God has I've seen a change in her through changing of her mind by the Word of God the situation was still there but when the Word of God becomes more real through the quickening of the Holy Spirit I am not talking about building some fantasies that you're this and that I'm not I'm talking about aligning yourself this is what God says and this is who I am I remember when I had to do that for my own self because I looked in the mirror for a long time I struggled with insecurity it was so chronic that I didn't want to live at the age of 13 and a half I skipped keyboarding class at Hanford High School in Richland because I was so shy to speak in front of 22 students I was skipping school I didn't tell my parents I stood at the bus station for six hours because I was scared to stand in front of people and my prayer at the time was God cause an accident so I will die because this world will be a better place without me in it and partially was because of my physical appearance and God never fixed my face yes I had two eye surgeries and they didn't help because I thought if my face will change if God will do some cosmetic surgery I will change how I feel inside I will be accepted I tried to find that acceptance in church at the time the church was small and we still had it in Russian language so there was pretty much three four positions you can be involved in behind on the soundboard I got kicked out I said elephant stepped on my ear the second place was to lead worship they said you're deaf they kicked me out of the worship team I'm not making this up and the third place was to read poems I felt a little embarrassing for a guy to read poems at church I did it one time and I was done I'm like come on Lord it can't be below than this let the ladies read the poems they can't preach anyway or they shouldn't be preaching anyway and the last one is preaching you know in the Slavic church you know you would preach and so I couldn't figure out which language to speak in I always mixed up my languages English wasn't good Ukrainian I already butchered it and the Russian I couldn't pronounce it so my preaching wasn't good so there I am holding on looking for something to clean myself to school doesn't work the church literally kicks me out of the four departments they got you know funny as it is now but it wasn't funny when you're 13 and a half years old and you're trying to find who you are you know how many rags I had here a million of them and it wasn't a miracle it wasn't some kind of a touch of God and all of that was gone it was step by step taking these words fearful and wonderfully you made and looking in the mirror I say Lord okay I can't look at that mirror I'm gonna look at this one Lord I'm gonna look at your word and I'm not gonna look at how my skin is stretched over my skeleton I will look at the fact that you you made me in your image and your likeness did I feel that no did, did I look like that no but it's what he said and when that changed me on the inside today as I'm speaking to you I'm not afraid of you and when you're looking at me you're not looking at me it's like well, what happened to that guy's eye the reason why you don't thinking that because I don't care about it and if you are thinking not good <laughs> if you're if you're thinking I don't care about it because I'm already married okay so your opinion doesn't matter <laughs> no. I'm a living witness that God's truth can transform your mind it will change how you will live it will change how you will minister it will change how you will relate to your children to your spouse and in your business remove the rags replace them with royal garments church are you with me are you ready for just one more and we're gonna pray yes. lastly so spiritual world is changed by fasting and prayer the mental capacity our mental uh, emotional world is changed by the truth of God's Word instead of our feelings truth of God's Word and number three is and this is the part that we've read earlier excuse me Esther comes after fasting dressed up she comes to the presence of the king and remember when I've read that Esther said to the king if it pleases the king let the king and Haman come today at the banquet that I have prepared for him now think about this you have a problem you're about to die all of your family is gonna die and this is the guy who allowed it to happen who <laughs> happens to be your husband you haven't seen him for 30 days and he's the only one who can change something and he asks you a question Esther what do you want what would you say? Ah! Help! We're gonna die! Please! We would create 
panic. I mean, it's, Mordecai did that. He screamed. He yelled. We would be like M M Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy. What touches me about this story the most is that Esther did not ask for her freedom. She asked for a meeting with the king. She asked to give him a meal, something she knew he would really like. So my third and final point is don't use God as a means to a goal. Make Him your goal. Don't use God as a means to get freedom. Make God your goal. Many of us don't think of it like that, that you can use God to get freedom mm -hmm. and then we leave Him. Because when we're in bondage, we fast and we pray, we cry out. Every prayer meeting, we're there. Every altar call, we're there. We don't care what people think. But then something takes place. We become calculated. We become confident. We mature. We become something because we are free now. That passion that existed before, that, that drive, that, that flame inside. Because see, you can scream and not have a flame, but when that's flame there, you, you, only you and God know that. That heat inside, the heat for God's love, this, this just passion for the Lord that was there, that was fueled by the pain of life. Many times when the fuel is gone, which is the pain of life, many people have never transitioned to putting a fuel of their passion. Why? Because from the beginning, God was not the goal. He was just someone who helped us to reach the goal. What was the goal? I don't want to live in pornography. I don't want to live in depression. What is the goal? I want to live a good life. That was the goal. God helped me to reach it and now that I reached the goal God is a sidekick that I need like a spare tire in case I find another goal I can't reach young people always ask me how to be used by God and I say this all the time stop using God make him your goal he will use you if you use him he's not the goal his gifts, His power, His freedom, His breakthrough is good. He wants to bless us with that. But in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, He doesn't say seek that. He says seek Him and everything else will be added. My fear is in the passion for freedom, in the passion for blessing, in the passion even for the anointing, in the passion for the miracles, that a lot of times God becomes just something that we use to get that and we can say the right lingo but the motives only the Holy Spirit can examine and I dare not today to try to correct your motives because I need God to help me correct mine but when I read the prodigal son and I see prodigal son to his father and this is what he says he says father give me what is mine so many charismatic people pray that prayer give me what is mine Give me my healing. Give me my breakthrough. Give me my blessing. God is so good. Even when you're wrong, He'll bless you. He gave him his stuff. And you know what happened to him? The prodigal son left the father. And then when he lost everything, he came back to his father. And I want you to see what he prayed. Now he had nothing. He came to his father and the Bible says, he said, Father, make me your servant. Let's not learn this lesson the hard way. Let's pray the first prayer. Let's pray the second prayer first. Let's do what Esther did. Instead of coming to the king and saying, King, deliver me. King, help me. Say, King, can we have a meeting with you? In the nine chapters of Exodus, 17 times Moses told to Pharaoh, let my people go. And he gave this reason. He didn't say because they are suffered enough. Let my people go. Why? Because they're in pain. Why? Because you're not paying them wages. They don't deserve this suffering. This is madness. He's, he did not say that's why you should let my people go. He said let my people go that they might serve me. 
God did not see any other reason for deliverance and freedom except the fact people would be available to serve him. Israel missed the point because when they came out of Egypt the only thing they did is complained and whined and worshiped cows. God doesn't think that he delivers you so you can be better. He thinks he delivers you so he can replace your monster and put himself as a master in that place so you can worship him. Most of us don't see deliverance the same way. What if we adjust right now and think a little bit differently? I want you to rise to your feet. Thank you for watching this content. I know this was a blessing to you. We would like to ask you to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell on our channel so that each time we upload something you can be notified. Don't forget to share this content with your friends and family and on social media. We're so thankful to you. Better is not good enough. The best is yet to come.